thank you very much to be here. Uh, is it your first uh, time in Nantes, and what do you think about the Tokyo? Oh, it's definitely my first time in Nantes. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the country. It's, I came to France for the first time this year, and I've seen uh, Paris and uh, Aix-en-Provence, and this this was a chance to see Nantes as well. Uh, yes, it's it's uh, very different from the North American environment where I live. And what do you think of the convention? Uh, we're having a fine time. It's uh, uh, it seems impeccably well organized, and uh, uh, everyone's been very friendly. I can't complain. Uh, you sign uh, a lot of books. Uh, is there uh, a question which is always the same from the French uh, reader? Uh, no, offhand, I can't think of anything that. Uh, uh, I mean, people will ask me, uh, people have said nice things about spin. Um, I get mixed reviews from my readers on, uh, on other books. Uh, but no, it's been a pleasure. It's been a, the, the language barrier makes it a little difficult to discuss these things with, with my readers here. Uh, but everyone's been very generous, generous toward me, and it's been a pleasure to meet my French readers. In all your books, uh, most of the time, uh, one of the, the big problems can say is time and the per perception of time. Uh, why is it always like that? Is it inside you? Uh, is it an idea you have from you, from your mind? Why this kind of subject? Well, uh, well, I think one of the most fundamental things that science fiction does is remind us that uh, uh, the present is not a privileged place. We tend to, uh, you know, as human beings, naturally, we tend to think of our own lives, the moment we spend in time, as, as the only significant part of time. The past is a myth, uh, and the future is a dream. Uh, science fiction exists to remind us that the past was a real place, as real as the time we occupy now, and that the future will be a real place, just as vividly real to its inhabitants as, as the present is to us. In other words, the, the present isn't a privileged place. Uh, and that can be a slightly frightening, slightly scary truth for people to, uh, to face up to. Uh, it reminds us that we are insignificant in a sense, uh, but it reminds us that our moment is no more or less significant than any other moment. Um, it's not a, a, a truth that we arrive at intuitively. Uh, uh, I think it's something we discover as we grow up. It's like the moment when you uh, so many writers have talked about the moment when you realize that you're mortal, that uh, your life will have a finite span and that one day you'll die. Uh, and science fiction reminds us that this is true not only of individuals, but of cultures, of societies, of civilizations, of planets, and of stars. Uh, we all have a lifespan. Uh, and yeah, that fascinated me when I discovered it in science fiction, and it continues to fascinate me. I put two books behind you, Darwinia and uh, Spin, one of the last for us. Mm -hmm. uh, one is about, in a way, the past, and the other about the future. Uh, did you work on the two books on the same way, or do, did you have a, a, another, two different way to, to build and to write these books? Well, no, no two books are written the same way, I think. Um, you know, each book presents a unique problem uh, for a writer for, from any number of angles. Um, no, I think that the difference I've noticed in my writing as it's progressed, I think, is just I have a, a certain uh, a higher degree of confidence in what I'm doing and how I can approach the material. Um, I think that makes a distinction not so much between Darwinian spin, but between my earlier work and my later work. And how, do, how did you have the idea of the spin? Um, well, the genesis of any idea is difficult to explain. Uh, ideas come together from small pieces. I, I once compared it to uh, what a writer does is uh, uh, not so much have a, a single great idea as to find, uh, like picking up colored pebbles to make a mosaic of. You know, no single pebble you know, explains the mosaic but each is an essential part of it. So many ideas went into spin. Um, but uh, 
part of it was simply wanting to confront the reader with what I was talking about before, that the depth of time and, and uh, the transience of uh, human existence. Uh, and it, it simply occurred to me it would be dramatic to do that by enclosing the planet itself uh, in, a, in a sort of essentially a time machine and throwing it forward in time. And that way we can confront not just an individual as H.G. Wells confronted an individual with the depths of the future in the time machine and, and my conceit was to do the same thing with an entire planet to, to uh, human civilization essentially to confront it with its own mortality. Uh -huh. uh, how did you work with uh, Gilles Goulet, your French tra translator? Oh, he's a, uh, Gilles Goulet is a pleasure to work with as a translator. Um, he, uh, we emailed back and forth consistently. Uh, he asks penetrating questions, sometimes uncomfortable questions. Uh, sometimes he's discovered errors that slip past my English proofreaders and copy editors. Uh, he, uh, I, I think the only problem between us is my, my phobia of email. I tend, to, I tend to let my email lapse for too long before I respond to it. He's been very generous about that, too. Um, no, it was, it was uh, an interesting experience to work with uh, Jules Goulet because uh, I don't know. I think he brings a different perspective to it than my than my English editors uh, and copy editors have. So that was useful to me too. Sometimes I wish. Sometimes after he's uh, written to me, I wish I could revise the English edition a little bit. Too. It will, will it be possible to do that? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, once something is said in print, it's it's there. You know, warts and all. It's, it is what it is. Uh, well then. The first book, book? works uh, and who make who made the name of uh, Wilson known to sci-fi fans, science fiction uh, readers, or something like that. Well, it, it helped. Uh, uh, I like to tell people that I, uh, you know, we have the expression in English a meteoric rise, uh, someone who appears like a star in the sky. I was not one of those people. Uh, I kind of eased into the field. Uh, but uh, yes, the the uh, Philip K. Dick Award brought in a slightly larger audience for me. Uh, the later awards did the same thing, and nominations did the same thing. Um, you know, the the awards inevitably are, are pleasing to receive, but I think that the importance they make in a writer's career is simply in expanding the audience that's available to him. Uh, and I think it also helps to build a writer's confidence to the extent that you can maybe explore territory you might have been reluctant to get into before because you weren't sure how it would be received. It's nice to know that there is an audience out there that will look sympathetically at your work uh, and that you can speak to and, and uh, that you can, that will give you some latitude about what you're, what you're writing. And like the Hugo. The Hugo did exactly that, yes, it did, in fact. Yeah. Is there really a... Um a big in impact on the uh, on the sale of the of the book in the U.S. Well, there's a significant impact on the sales. Um, uh, small things help. Small things help, but not that the Hugo was a small thing. But I mean, the Hugo, uh, the Hugo helped to sell the book. The uh, the unexpected endorsement by Stephen King helped helped mm -hmm. to uh, sell the book and bring a, a wider audience in. Um, but I think there's also a, a process of uh, simply building brick by brick a career as a writer. Uh, you know, uh, one book builds on the success of the last, and uh, and uh, eventually you have a fairly sturdy assembly of, of, of work in front of you. I don't know if I will express it correctly, but you work mainly on, on the perception of time and also on, on the distortion of the, of the reality. Is it uh, linked for you? Is it, uh, the two are going together? Uh, in, in a sense, in a sense. I've, I've read uh, fairly extensively, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I've read fairly extensively in popular science. Uh, and I am constantly reminded that we live in a very strange universe. Uh, that the human perspective is an extremely limited one. Uh, not just temporal, we were talking about time, and uh, you know we see a small chunk of what's an enormous amount of time, but we also see a very small piece of, a, of an enormously large universe. 
um, that uh, that disorient you know I, I, you can call it a disorienting idea because it it changes your sense of place in the universe. I think that's one of the fundamental things science fiction does. Uh, we take the universe we find around us for granted. Uh, as science fiction, I think it is because no, no, no. The universe is strange in all ways. Uh, the things you take for granted are, are not to be taken for granted. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I think I expressed this in an essay somewhere. I said that the purpose of science fiction is just to occasionally come along and tap you on the shoulder and tell you how fucking strange the universe is. Um, and I think, you know, and, and it's one of the things I, I try to do. I hope I succeed at it. About science fiction, did you uh, read, and do you read today uh, some, some science fiction uh, novel, and what kind of writers do you like uh, when you read? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I like to say that, I, that it was science fiction that introduced me to literature. I learned to love reading because I loved science fiction as a child. Uh, and I came up through all the, the uh, writers you would expect that I had read. I read Bradbury and Heinlein and Clifford Simak and uh, Theodore Sturgeon and people like that. And they're, they're still very much in the back of my mind when I think about science fiction. Um, but we are, of course, many decades beyond that era of science fiction. Um, I don't read as, as many of my colleagues in the field as perhaps I should, uh, just because I'm reading outside the field. Um, and I'm always discovering new writers. I hesitate to name an influence because every month I've discovered someone else. At the moment it's uh, Cormac McCarthy. I've been reading a great deal of Cormac McCarthy's work. Um, uh, And I read, you know, uh, obscure mainstream writers too. And I've been reading a lot of 19th century American fiction, popular fiction, very obscure, uh, for a book I'm writing now uh, that has a, that kind of flavor to it. So I, I hesitate to, to to bring up names as influences because there there are simply so many of them. For, for the first time with Pin, you are uh, building uh, uh, one book and another linked to the first one, and maybe a third one. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the, the writing of Spin, uh, did you know that uh, it could be like that or not? I had the possibility in mind, but Spin was meant to be a novel that stands alone, stands by itself. It doesn't require a sequel. Uh, I gave it a sequel. I wrote the book Axis, and there will be a third book uh, called Vortex. Uh, Not, but not because spin was incomplete. I, I, I think I just wanted to explore a little farther some of the ideas and questions that I raised in spin, uh, the relationship between humanity and the uh, entities called the hypotheticals in, in the story. Um, but I also wanted to write three different kinds of books. I didn't want spin and spin redux, and, mm -hmm. you know, spin yet again. Uh, So Axis is a more, I think, a more intimate book. It covers a shorter period of time in the lives of the characters. It doesn't have the vast expansiveness of spin. Uh, it uh, operates in some ways almost as a mystery, as much as a science fiction novel. And Vortex, when I write it, uh, I think it's going to return to the large scale. Uh, it's going to uh, take some of the characters I introduced in Axis and uh, thrust them forward, even farther forward uh, in time, uh, millions, billions, you know, of years. Uh, and we get to look at the interaction between the human species and the hypotheticals and the, the uh, life cycles of civilizations, essentially. Very uh, Stapledonian ideas, if you know Olaf Stapledon, the writer. Uh, but again, I want to bring a kind of human intimacy to it at the same time. An hour ago, we talked with uh, Gregory Benford, and uh, we said that his way, uh, his uh, research and his uh, novels were a way to go uh, to escape from Earth. And with you, I have the feeling that when you go, when you escape from Earth in your books, it's a way to be back on Earth. Yeah, it's a way of reimagining the, the familiar, in a sense, from a different perspective. 
no, I don't. Uh, I don't believe that science fiction at its best is an escapist literature. Uh, I think. Well, I mean, uh, any novel that we read, in a sense, is an escape from reality or a substitution of a new reality. But it, it, but any novel also raises questions that are pertinent to our lives. Uh, in Spin, Spin, for instance, is a is a large scale book, but it, it inevitably raises questions about, for instance. Uh, uh, the sustainability of human civilization in the face of ecological collapse, uh, uh, the exhaustion of resources on Earth, uh, the end of oil. Uh, those issues arise naturally from the larger concerns, I think. What do you think, actually, of this political and global uh, situation on the Earth? Well, I've, I've, been, I've had to confront it fairly directly because I'm working on a book now that's not related to the SPIN series. Uh, that's set in a post-collapse 22nd century. Uh, oil has been, any useful amount of oil has been depleted, resources have been depleted, uh, the human population has been depleted in a kind of uh, perfect storm of ecological and social collapse. Um, it's much like the way uh, science fiction writers in the 50s and 60s used to imagine the nuclear holocaust. Uh, they did an interesting job, I think, in those days of sort of imaginatively confronting the idea of nuclear warfare. Uh, the crisis we confront now, I think, is, is just as pressing as the issue of nuclear warfare. Uh, it's morally more complex, which interests me. Um, I, once again, we face the possible destruction of human civilization. Uh, but this time, there is no one has their finger on the button which means no one can choose not to push the button. We each, the, the, the button that destroys the world is essentially distributed among eight billion human beings. Uh, and it's, it suggests there that, I, I don't think we have a good mechanism globally for dealing with these kind of problems because we haven't confronted them before. Uh, and I don't know, I, I find it hard to be optimistic about our future at the moment. At the same time, the human race is not going to be extinct in 100, 200, 300 years. We will come to some new uh, arrangement with nature that's more sustainable, not because I think we're noble or because we want to, but because we'll have to. We'll be forced into it at some point as a species. We can't sustain what we're doing now indefinitely. Um, the question for me is how painful is that process going to be? And I suspect it's going to be very painful indeed. Uh, perhaps not as much for our generation as for the generation that follows us and the generation that follows that. Um, but these are very science fictional ideas that are very pertinent and relevant to the modern world. And I think that's, that's an interesting moment for science fiction right now. And uh, do you still have, do you still put trust on the human being? Uh, well, I'm a little cynical about it, uh, but I do it seems. I do have a certain faith in our ingenuity. I mean, it's our ingenuity that got us into this problem in the first place. Uh, uh, I think ingenuity will be part of the solution, human ingenuity. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I like us as a species, to tell you the truth. I'm not cynical and I'm not, I'm not opposed to humanity. I'm not, I'm not cynical about humanity. Uh, I just think we've crawled a long way out on a very fragile limb, on a very tall tree. Uh, and I don't like the idea of the, the inevitable fall. Uh, but that doesn't mean I think that... Uh, I, I don't like the kind of... Eco, uh, you sometimes get a sense from people who talk about the ecology that they dislike human beings, or they see human beings as a, as a kind of infection uh, on the earth. Uh, I don't see us that way. Uh, I think we, we did that. We're not evil creatures who did that purposefully. I think we got here by a series of, uh, you know, the, the, what I would say is the man who invented the internal combustion engine was not trying to melt the poles. Uh, it, was, it was a perfectly, uh, innocent act with an unforeseen consequence. Uh, and uh, today we're seeing a lot of uh, unforeseen consequences of many innocent acts. And uh, that interests me morally too, and morally and artistically as a, as a writer.
Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.